Yeah, okay. So uh, thanks everyone for logging in today. Uh, today we're going to hear from Matthias van Ditschel about uh, computational auction evolution reaction studies. So Matthias uh, works in the same department as me at the University of Limerick and I'm um, really looking forward to hearing myself uh, what he's going to talk about today, learning about what Matthias does. And it's a bit different from our seminars so far. So this is more computational uh, talk uh, linked to electrochemistry rather than uh, experimental electrochemistry. So Matthias, uh, over to you and thanks. Thank you, Michal, for the kind introduction. So today I will mainly speak to you about uh, heterogeneous oxygen evolution systems like mixed metal oxyhydroxides and the bifunctionality we can expect there if we have multiple metals. And I will also show two projects on molecular water oxidation catalysts that I have been doing over the last years. So a brief introduction to my background. I studied chemical engineering, then did a PhD in molecular modeling. And then I started my postdoc time and I spent time in four different countries, four different research groups. So first I was mainly focusing on describing catalysis in zeolites and MOPs. Then I was more focusing on active site engineering within MOFs or metal organic frameworks. I had also a period in Sweden where I focused on microkinetic modeling and up in isothermodynamics. And then finally, when I was in Aalto University in Finland, I started uh, computational e electrocatalysis research. So uh, that is uh, what I'm going to talk to do, uh, to talk about today. So most of you might have a um, more elaborate background in electrocatalysis. It's still quite new for me. So uh, if I say something that is not appropriate, please uh, mention that during the questions session. So we start with a brief introduction in photoelectrochemical oxygen evolution and then also the computational hydrogen electrode which I use. I will uh, elaborate on that. So in nature we have the oxygen evolution reaction taking place via a system with different proteins and this system also contains a manganese calcium oxide and the active site there undergoes five different states and some of these states can be hop from one state to the other state um, uh, with the help of light so for example to excite or eliminate an electron that can happen and most of the these steps in this catalytic cycle um, are thus light driven and also you see that three of these steps for example from S2 to S3 a proton electron pair is ejected here from three to four as well a proton electron pair is ejected so in principle we can simplify this whole system by just saying that we have water coming in and oxygen going out and also four proton electron pairs coming out. Then we can thus simplify this five step process into um, a four step process where proton and electron motion are coupled. So if we want to mimic nature, we need a semiconductor, uh, which can then create electron hole pairs upon adsorption of light and then it's then the holes that will catalyze the water oxidation to form oxygen and then at the cathode site the electrons will be used to combine with protons to generate hydrogen. So today we will mainly focus on the anode site and the electrochemical processes taking place on the anode side, on an electrocatalyst that is specific for uh, 
oxygen evolution catalysis. So there's a thermodynamic price you have to pay for each proton electron pair you generate. That is 1.23 electron volts. But in practice, these proton electron pairs are generated in different steps. And some of these steps, they simply cost more um, uh, in energy. So then you pay a higher price and that's called the overpotential. Uh, represented by eta. So here is a good photoelectrochemical anode that is used today. So these are silicon nanocones. On top of the silicon nanocones, we have a semiconductor system that's uh, bismuth vanadate with also some molybdenum. But if we want to make it more active, this system, we can load this photo anode with uh, an electrocatalyst, for example, iron, nickel, oxyhydroxide, um, and that promotes then the OER process. So we, here we see, for example, on this figure, uh, on the bottom right, in black, we see the performance on a typical molybdenum bismuth vanadate without iron nickel oxyhydroxide and with iron nickel oxyhydroxide. And we see that the current starts flowing at a lower potential versus the reversible hydrogen electrode for the system with iron nickel oxyhydroxide. So we can also uh, formulate that differently. We can say that the system with iron nickel oxyhydroxide has a lower onset over potential. So now to the computational hydrogen electrode. So how we can approximate these electrochemical steps, we can assume that one proton electron pair is equivalent with half of a hydrogen molecule. So this reaction is with a free energy of zero at pH zero. And then we can describe four different states of the system. We start from an empty site. We go through a series of species. So metal hydroxide, metal oxo and metal OOH and then we generate, we come back to the uh, empty side again in step four. In each of these steps, we eject then a proton electron pair or half of a hydrogen molecule. So we can compute thus the free energy difference for each of these steps. Uh, and we can also write this whole process in alkaline environment then instead of water, OH minus reacts and we eject an electron and produce water. But in principle for the computational description, we just need to calculate the empty side, empty side with OH, with OXO and with OOH. Um, so it's represented again here. We have a mononuclear or single side mechanism. This means that only one metal or one, on one active side is involved in the catalysis. So everything happens on that catalytic side. If we plot then the free energy and function of the steps, we get what we call an electrochemical step plot where we see what is the price we pay for each step, for each proton electron pair that is ejected when water comes in. Um, and also, if we know this, we know that the sum of all these steps should be 2.94 electron volt, and we can calculate the overpotential for the OER process by just taking the maximum of the steps minus 1.23 and we get then the overpotential in volt. So we, I have to remark that the computational hydrogen 
oxygen electrode does not consider uh, variations in the system, for example, charge in function of the electrode potential. So an example I give here. So here we have the potential and we see at higher potentials, we have more iron plus plus species. So that's our iron four plus species. Uh, and at lower potentials, we would have more iron plus three species. And to uh, describe um, systems, um, let's say, at constant electropotential, we would need another uh, type of theoretical approach, and this is called grand canonical DFT. But even this would be uh, not complete yet because many of the species uh, that we have to describe have a multi-reference character. So there's still plenty of uh, uh, theoretical methodology improvement that needs to be do done within uh, computational electrocatalysis research. So let's go to our first problem, bifunctionality and mixed metal oxyhydroxides. So the reason why um, we started this research um, was, in was in fact this paper on uh, metal phosphide precatalyst. So there it was found that this three metallic iron, copper, nickel phosphide gives a much lower onset potential for the OER uh, process compared to the bimetallic and the monometallic phosphides. So this trimetallic catalyst should thus contain more active sites that are active at a lower potential versus the reversible hydrogen electrode. And the bimetallic catalyst should contain more uh, active sites compared to the monometallic catalyst. So what are then the active sites? And the active sites, we could see uh, what happens with these uh, phosphide pre-catalysts during catalysis. We see that from a, a shift in the XPS spectra of the uh, 2P metal edge, we see a shift to the left for uh, all metals. So that means they are oxidized. Um, so the, the real catalyst we find under operating conditions will probably not be a phosphide, but more something like a metal oxyhydroxide with some phosphate ligands, uh, rather than a pure a metal phosphide catalyst. So previously studies have been uh, done to unravel what is now the best combination between cobalt, iron, and nickel uh, for OER. So that is the combination that gives the lowest overpotential. So for example, we see that the lowest overpotential is purple here, um, can be achieved for this type of metallic combinations. And if we look at higher currents, we see that only combinations of uh, nickel and iron are quite active. And notice here that even a little bit of iron causes already a low overpotential. So we don't need a lot of iron um, to have a good uh, OER catalyst. If we have a little bit of iron within nickel OOH, or nickel oxyhydroxide, it uh, seems to work also. Um, so to explain the activity of these bimetallic systems, we can look to alternative OER mechanisms. So alternative, um, so I mean not mononuclear or single site, but binuclear or Bifunctional. So here is a, an example, the earliest example 
of a bifunctional road for these metal oxyhydroxides that appeared in literature. So we have um, an active edge of iron oxyhydroxide that is combined with an acceptor site. So how does it go? We start from empty site, we go to OH, OXO, and then something happens after the nucleophilic attack of water on this OXO group. Uh, rather than going through this metal OOH intermediate or species, um, the acceptor site is hydrogenated and oxygen is generated in the third step. And this type of uh, alternative road, which is possible on uh, um, when you have two different active sites, causes then the reaction to happen at a lower overpotential. So uh, here you see that um, the reaction can happen with the acceptor site at an overpotential that is 0.4 volt lower than uh, with a pure iron OOH system. So that's uh, computationally calculated. So again, to repeat what happens, we compare the mononuclear or single site mechanism with the binuclear or dual site mechanism. So within the binuclear system um, or the dual site mechanism, better we have this empty metal site we go through a metal oh then a metal oxo and then in the third step things happen that are crucial water attacks we eject the proton electron pair we generate oxygen and we hydrogenate the acceptor site so how can this reaction take place we start from a water attack on the metal oxo uh, after that has happened, the proton moves from the oxygen to the acceptor, while the electron moves through the metal oxyhydroxide to the acceptor. And like this, we generate a hydrogenated acceptor site. So in reality, we need uh, a solvent to catalyze this mechanism. So that can be very intuitively visualized like this. We have some water molecules that connect the OH species with the acceptor side. And then we can see that these are actually in equilibrium with each other. Um, actually, uh, we have also done some uh, a molecular dynamic studies that show that this interconversion happens sometimes spontaneously when this metal OOH species is formed. We, we can sometimes spontaneously go to a system with a hydrogenated acceptor site. So to explain now um, this uh, three metallic metal oxyhydroxides, um, I took a look in literature and found a study on gamma iron, nickel iron OH models. So uh, gamma means we have intercalation of potassium and water within uh, sheets of metal oxyhydroxide. And then one of the edge atoms within this system is the active site. So these are calculated reaction pathways from literature uh, where they found a quite low overpotential for uh, iron, nickel, oxyhydroxide systems, but not so low as observed experimentally. But suppose we use now the bifunctional mechanism. So we, we start with 
gamma metal oxyhydroxides where we have potassium intercalation and water intercalation. And uh, we combine these gamma metal oxyhydroxides with what we call beta metal oxyhydroxides. They don't have any um, intercalation. They're just layered. And uh, most of the metal sides are here two plus, um, while here they are three plus, or a bit higher than three plus because of the potassium intercalation, which is not uh, completely charge compensating. But uh, then if we combine this edge with this type of acceptor system, we have something like three different active sites that we have here for three different metal sites. Uh, so that can be pure cobalt, pure iron or pure nickel metal oxyhydroxide. Uh, and then three different active sites for each of the pure system that we can combine with a whole series of different acceptor sites that are bimetallic in nature. Um, so we can do a screening study between both these edge sites and these acceptor sites. So then we get a lot of combinations in our study. And actually close to the experimental overpotential, um, so when the OER process is happening, these two phases of metal oxyhydroxides are both present. Um, even uh, recent uh, computational studies indicate uh, that. So we, we see for the hydroxides as active catalysts. So how do we describe that computationally? Or how do we calculate the different states? Um, I calculated it in VASP with a B van der Waals functional. Uh, and these are then some computational parameters that we set. So we can calculate on, for example, star, site star one, the whole catalytic cycle for a mononuclear uh, pathway. So here is the empty site in purple, then step, second step OH, third step OXO, fourth step metal OOH. And then with acceptor, it looks a bit different. Then we go from the OXO to a hydrogenated acceptor site and already generate oxygen uh, within the third step. And then we regenerate the hydrogenated acceptor site in the fourth step. Um, of course, we can here have some equilibration reactions of the OXO also happening. So these are all additional complexities uh, within these systems that we can take care of. The same for site star two in our model system, the same for star, site star three in the model system. So in the end, we have screened many different uh, edge sites, and we can now compare their um, OER performance if we look at the overpotential. So for iron, we find that this site star one is the best one. For cobalt, that is star two. For nickel OOH, that is star one. But even more important is uh, to know if they are relevant is to look at uh, the stability of these active sites. So then we see that, for example, site three is more stable than star uh, two and star one in case of iron. Uh, and in case of cobalt, we see that star two is more stable than the other one. Um, but uh, yeah, star two and star one are nearly equivalent. Um, with uh, nickel, we see that star three is actually 
the most stable one and uh, well surprisingly this results in the the, the highest over potential on this side so uh, if we have um, this star 3 as most abundant uh, active site it, it doesn't mean because it's most abundant and most stable that um, the reaction takes place um, on these sites. So this just to say that everything is uh, quite complex um, but now that we have screened the different edge sites and acceptor sites, so here I have just discussed the edge sites for uh, gamma metal oxyhydroxides, we can have a look what happens if we combine the edge site with a suitable acceptor site within the bifunctional mechanism. This is, for example, done for iron oxyhydroxide. If we combine that with an acceptor site that contains both nickel and cobalt, we can lower the overpotential from 1 volt to 0.16 volt uh, for the three metallic system. And, and, and that is what is important. So if we have three metallic systems, now we can know why they lower the overpotential. The same for cobalt. Here we can also lower the overpotential from 0.23 volts to 0.12 volts if we combine it with the iron nickel uh, oxyhydroxide acceptors. For uh, the nickel, uh, the same. If we combine that with an iron cobalt uh, acceptor site, we can lower the overpotential from 0.8 to 0.14 volts. So we can also represent that graphically in a 3D plot based on scaling relationships. This is because there's universal scaling relationships between all um, of the intermediates within the OER process. So here you see these scaling relationships for the mononuclear or single site route. But we can also replace this species within the bifunctional route um, with oxygen hydrogenated acceptor site and empty site. And if we then use these scaling relationships, we can come up with a 3D volcano plot. And we see here uh, on the x-axis um, the delta G of step one and step two, that's on the edge system or the gamma metal oxyhydroxide system. And then on the y axis, we have something that is solely acceptor dependent, um, which represents then the regeneration of the acceptor site. And then we can see that we have different areas in this figure. Um, and this, for example, in this area where we have step three, um, we know that step three will be rate determining. And for the dual side mechanism, well, we can also have step three prime and step four prime rate determining. So what happens now if we plot um, the act most active edge systems and acceptors on this graph. Then here, if we take the most active edge systems and we combine them with the most active uh, acceptor sites, we see that why the overpotential is actually getting lower when we work with three metallic systems. And that's because we have a bifunctional mechanism that is operative. So uh, that's basically the conclusion of this work that uh, bifunctionality explains why mixed metal oxyhydroxides are active. Um, but now in, in this study that I have showed you, both the edge system or the acceptor system 
were two different model systems. In reality, both Edge and Acceptor are connected within one model system. So in principle, that means we should do a new study where both uh, Acceptor side um, and edge, Active Edge sites are in one model system. And this is what has been done in a more recent study where we have um, here um, a nickel oxyhydroxide that can be doped with iron. And here you see, for example, the active site in dark blue. Potassium can be present in purple because we work in alkaline conditions typically. Um, And then we can study on this nickel oxyhydroxide what is actually the preferred iron position. What, where is the preferred iron doping? Uh, we can do this study for both ORR and OER. So ORR, what, well, to see the distinction, well, for the ORR process, we, we work at a potential that is lower than 1.23 volt. That, that means that O2 can be converted in water and we can generate a Umax. Uh, that's the maximum pro potential that the ORR process can deliver at a minimal current and we have to define that minimal current. The same we, we do typically for the OER process. Here O2 is generated if we have the electrode at a potential U min. And then the difference between, between U min and the 1.23 volts, that will be the overpotential. So we can speak actually of an overpotential for the OER process, and also we can speak about an overpotential for the ORR process. So um, again, different states have been investigated. Uh, it's always quite similar methodology. Um, now, the hydrogenated acceptor site uh, has been named as an equilibrated metal OOH species. Uh, and we can also work with an equilibrated metal oxo species. So then this, this hydrogen at the edge jumps onto the oxo and this can be more stable uh, for some metal oxyhydroxide edges, not for all of them. So then we, we can actually come up with four different mechanisms. The mechanisms that, that was most interesting was S4. Um, so S4 goes via an equilibrated OXO and an equilibrated OH. So that's a metal OO state with a hydrogenated acceptor site. Um, so let's go to the results. But first, we mentioned something, an experimental study, a photoelectrochemical study, where they used UV-Vis to detect what is now the active state during a catalysis. So the system that we have studied uh, computationally is actually the system in gray. That's a, a nickel OOH with very low amount of iron lower than 5%. So in this system, um, well, we, we, jet, we have actually as active site um, nickel 4 plus and then iron 3 plus is present in the neighborhood. Um, and let's see whether this is also what we can find 
computationally. Um, if we add, by the way, this is just uh, some extra information. If we would work with a higher iron concentration, then we're here in, in C, then we would actually have iron 4 plus and nickel 3 plus. So uh, that surprisingly changes the whole story. Um, but in our system, we found that the best iron doping site was M2 here, that's in the second layer, that gave the lowest overpotential, both for the OER as for the ORR process. So that, that seems to correspond uh, quite well with the active nickel four plus that we have. And so that seems to confirm this uh, experimental study. So here we can represent things differently. What we have calculated here are the free energy and function of the different states uh, calculated. Um, so we calculate the green energy levels, that's the same as the step plot, but now we can visualize this uh, delta G in function of U min for the OER process and in function of U max for the ORR process. And we have to read this graph from left to right for the OER process, so then we see um, in red, for example, the red bars, which reactions are rate determining in the OER process. It's not the reaction from here to here. It's not the reaction from the metal oxo to the metal OOH. It's the first reaction that is rate determining within the OER process. So, um, at least for with no dopant. If we have a dopant in the most in the best uh, position M2, then it will be the attack of water to the metal oxo that will be rate determining. So then this step becomes zero uh, if we fill in human. Uh, the same we can read this plot also for ORR. But then we have to read from right to left. Uh, so, in, in the ORR process for a uh, nickel iron OOH uh, with iron in the M2 position, we see that the last step, uh, the generation of the empty site, is then rate determining. So, uh, that is it for uh, uh, metal oxyhydroxides. Now, I will show you some uh, research results. On molecular OER catalysts. Uh, the active site is more well defined within molecular uh, OER catalysts. So it's, it's uh, easy to work with uh, computationally, uh, much more easy than these heterogeneous uh, mixed metal oxyhydroxide. So in the, in the first study that was uh, recently published, uh, we compared this complex with a variant of this complex where we have OH groups um, instead of hydrogen termination. So that's called complex two, that is called complex one. Um, complex two had a quite low onset uh, OER potential, uh, OER onset potential. Uh, both after one cycle and also after 100 cycles. Uh, the current starts flowing at a, a low potential versus the reversible hydrogen electrode. What we also saw in electrochemical impedance studies is that the, the charge transfer resistance of complex two is much lower than for complex one. Um, and to explain why we have such an early onset potential uh, for complex two, um, but then at higher uh, potential, 
we see that their behavior at more cycles is pretty similar, just there's more current flowing for complex two. So to, to study that, I looked first at film formation and I saw that film uh, can form much uh, better for the complex two. So that's more exotherm. So in bold, that's the value with solvent correction. Um, and that's the value without solvent correction. Uh, but if we look at things computationally, the overpotential we get is very similar for complex one and complex two. Um, so clearly that does not explain so much why complex two has a lower charge transfer resistance. And then to explain the charge transfer resistance, we can maybe uh, hypothesize that it's the connection between the um, hydroxyl group and the glassy carbon electrode um, that is very important to lower the charge transfer resistance. Um, and we see that in each of the steps, and so empty sites, OH, OXO, and OOH, we see we have a, a conjugated system uh, that allows electron transfer here from the LUMO um, back to the electrode. So that uh, actually can explain why we have for complex two a higher current flowing uh, as for complex one, where the ligand should be oxidized during the catalysis and if we then during the catalysis get some OH groups here, they can also anchor to the catalyst. But anchoring via this OH to the catalyst seems very sterically hindered if both ligands are still present. So I, I won't talk about uh, these things in detail, just to say that uh, these Cobalt complex or cobalt complex two was a very stable at low pH even um, compared to traditional OER catalysts. So then a last problem for today is a copper TCA molecular catalyst. So experimentally a film forms and this film can be characterized by XRD uh, and actually experimentally there's a very low overpotential observed for this film but uh, computationally I did not manage to explain this uh, so both the molecular complex as the film had quite uh, high overpotentials computation higher than one volt uh, so totally not corresponding with a low overpotential observed experimentally. So that means experimentally something else must uh, happen. Um, and you see here that uh, these copper complexes uh, from this study um, were among the best. So at, at a quite low pH, achieving a very low overpotential for this film is quite surprising actually. Um, why that is, so uh, maybe it's because defects are formed within this copper TCA film because if I calculate the different steps uh, in the catalytic cycle on a defective system I obtain a much lower overpotential. That is more in line with experiment. So uh, that could potentially explain why this film uh, is active and has such a low overpotential for uh, OER. So here you, you see if we have um, no defect, then the active site is actually six coordinated. But if we would have a defect, then the active site is um, or fold coordinated um, in case of metal oxo and metal OH species. So 
some conclusions for these molecular uh, OER complexes that ligand defects might be very important. Uh, also, OH substitution of one ligand might be also an important factor to lower the charge transfer resistance. But we can, of course, not fully exclude that uh, these molecular complexes during the OER process uh, start forming other type of phases um, like metal oxyhydroxides or metal oxides with some ligands uh, still coordinating to them uh, that we cannot exclude, of course, com completely un until further uh, experimental studies uh, and computational studies uh, will elucidate these manners. I would like to thank uh, research groups in Alto, KIT, Wuhan University of Technology and Gothenburg University for uh, collaboration on these projects and uh, you for your attention. Thanks very much, Matthias. Uh, really beautiful talk there on how much is really happening when we do our electrochemistry at the surface of the catalyst. I don't think we uh, appreciate that sometimes when we just look at the onset potential maybe. Uh, 